we are talking about the futurists, which uh, you know comes into future regions as well as future makers, future growers, future varieties, um, and trends that are coming in in that as well. So it's a loose term, but you know that's all we could come up with. So <laughs> we were we were by the varieties in front of you and the styles made, we were feeling like these. This is the the term to run yeah, with, the yeah. title to run with for this session. And it also begs the question. Uh, uh, are these producers doing the right thing by exploring these varieties and making wines in, in the particular style that you see them presented today? Yeah, and is, is the region ready for futurists or is, does it still need to cement itself as a classic region first? You know, perhaps that's a question. Is there enough, you know, Savion Blanc, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, already on lists, or do we need to expand that category as well? Is, is there room for growth? Um, so that's... Yeah. That sounds like an MW exam question to me. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few in here, so... <laughs> Very good. Excellent. So touching on what we went through earlier, the main key factors that, that we find to be similar about Oregon and New Zealand, we know this is an odd an odd mashup to see two regions sharing wines and tables and education um, with all of you. So um, we'd just like to bring it back for a minute to the fact that our latitudes are very similar. So we have extended daylight hours. Um, we do. We are both located in the Ring of Fire. So we have volcanic, young, youthful soils and uh, marine sediment uplifts. So very youthful soils in comparison to many other growing regions. And then both of our regions really prioritize sustainable and sustainable wine growing efforts as, as part of you know, what we hold true and dear to our culture and philosophy of wine making and wine growing um, in, our, in our regions. Uh, and then another where less than 1% of the world's total wine production and Oregon is um, around 1% of total US wine production. So where small regions trying to you know, stand big and stand tall in a, in a big global economy, um, but where you know, small growers, small makers, small production, um, but we fight big. <laughs> we make a yeah. big impact. Um, complex, complex wines, laid back personalities, sometimes. Yeah, I think <laughs> one of the leading words in the slide really is complex because when you're a small producer, and uh, Brie alluded to this in the first session this morning, that you know 5,000 cases is frankly very small in terms of volume of production, and that you can't help but make complex wines because you're making very individual wines at the same time. So you have to embrace them for what they are and that they represent the place that they come from, not trying to be something else. They're not modelled on anything. They are Oregon wines or they are New Zealand wines. They're not Burgundy or Bordeaux. Good point. So again, familiarising yourself with where we are in this planet, in this earth. So above California, 45, between 42 and 46 degrees north is where Oregon is located. And then central Otago, New Zealand, um, down between 30, is it 36 and 40? Well, the whole country fits between 30 and 50 <laughs> anyway, so it's wholly go. within the Wholly band. within, <laughs> so the 40th parallels of wine growing, wine growing really on the edge. And, you know, I sort of alluded to it a little in the Pinot Noirs, but I find um, that most of the most complex wines um, in the world are grown on the edges of where grape growing is actually possible. Um, and so I find the structure and complexity and intensity in those wines um, to always be slightly more compelling than where the grapes just to you know, get to hang out and everything's easy and people can you know, reliably grow and ripen everything that they ever desire. Um, so it's maybe part of that you know, tenacity of culture mm -hmm. and same with the grape varieties as well. Um, sunlight is important, that impact of UV on the skin. So we get about 15 hours a day um, sunlight during the growing season. That's um, you know, two hours more than, uh, say, Napa or Sonoma 
uh, for Oregon um, and and New Zealand's the same. Very you know long daylight hours, long growing season, long Indian summers we get in both regions. Mm. Um, and then, in addition to that additional sunlight and growing season, we also are closer to the sun and to thinning ozone layers, and especially in New Zealand. Um, and so that ozone impact is is really um, impactful on the wines and so it does create thicker skins um it i also think it you know leads to some of that crunch and mm. and tension that you find on the palate in in a lot of our wines as well um and also we have um, a large diurnal shift in both regions as well which helps preserve the acidity as well in in all of our wines okay so if you just, I mean, the picture on screen at the moment is, really represents the, um, the quote unquote, the ring of fire that um, a lot of um, places are exposed to. Um, you can see that in that huge South Pacific Basin and the, um, uh, the oceans above in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's, it's an important slide just to mention climate change. So we, we got to raise a um, show of hands earlier on today who, who subscribe to the idea of climate change or global warming, and a number of hands went up. And I pointed out that because of change, per se, the polar caps are melting. That's a fact. But what that delivers in terms of climate change is ocean currents are getting colder. And New Zealand is one of the, is the first country on the planet to be exposed to um, cool, the cooling effect of oceans. And so it's not unusual to see an iceberg every now and again sort of travel up the east coast of the South Island because that is the effect of it. But the cooling oceans force climate change. And there is, there's plenty of science to prove that. But because of the climate change, that has an impact on atmosphere conditions and extremes in weather. So, you know, we do get stronger winds, we do get heavier rains, we do get more cyclones, we do get more hurricanes. That has got to have an impact on agriculture as a whole for humans. And of course, viticulture um, by default suffers from that as well. So we have to change our management. We have to change our management in the vineyard in terms of um, what happens below the ground, what happens on the ground and above the ground to, to compensate. So we're, we're in a phase, if you like, of figuring out how we compensate in our vineyards. And the impacts that Brie has sort of talked about, you know, o ozone holes that are slowly closing up for whatever reason it's happening, but they're still open in the ripening season, causes sunburn. So how do you counteract that when you've got different phenolics in your wine now because of thicker skins of grape varieties? And that dovetails into disease pressures in vineyards as well. Everything is in change, it's in flux. And in our lifetime, we'll notice a small amount of it, but it really is you know, the future generations that are gonna have to deal with it more than us. Yeah, and you know, to speak to Oregon's part in that changing climate conversation as well, you know, as a dry grown region, um, the majority of our vineyards do not have irrigation set up. We do not have you know, uh, access to rivers, creeks, ponds on site, uh, generally speaking. If you're thinking now as a vineyard management <coughs> company, you're looking at building in irrigation ponds um, and things that you can collect water for through the growing season or through the winter because our growing seasons are so dry. So we rely on our winter uh, rainfall and snow packs to really deliver that irrigation water um, into the ground and for the ground to store all of that uh, water for our growing season, which basically doesn't rain until June, until September. <clears throat> you know, you can see where the Willamette Valley in Oregon is located on the coast there, we're really just protected by a very low-lying coast range mountain, which you know protects us from the coastal influence. We're protected on the east side by the Cascade Range, which protects us from some really drying and harsh continental climatic conditions. But on our western side, we're just buffered by a low coast range, which still lets through Pacific storms. And as Cameron mentioned, in New Zealand, they're getting more erratic events, and so are we as well. So we don't know when our season is going to end. So we need to be very you know, 
on top and in the vineyard constantly during our growing season. But the major impact that climate is having at the moment is on that uh, water retention in the soil. We're now into our fifth vintage of very warm, dry uh, summers and the the vines do not have a lot of you know really water to tap into so you know while while we love having weather like this in Oregon and we've had that for the last couple of weeks we are still really trying to you know hope that we get a little bit more rainfall before June and and that really dry season starts to kick in because once we get to July there's no water No, we got uh, a little extended uh, snowfall this season, um, but it only just took us out of the drought pattern. Um, we still are fairly dry. We had a very dry November, December, um, and really only just started seeing some rainfall and snow falling in January and February and March, and then it's dried up again. So um, we're still relying on, on rainfall to, to boost our, our soil levels. It, it, this year has definitely been better than, than the year before, but we're we're going to be impacted by a dry season, um, and you you know you see it um, in the vineyard, and you see it in people's habits by you know trying to move towards no-till farming and things that aren't going to you know deplete more um, you know more of the moisture in the vineyard and carbon and everything like that. So there's a lot more um, canopy and soil management being um, you know. You know, taken engaged. care of now, gauged. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's a very interesting time, um, and and the viticulturists and winemakers have to be very responsive and and immediate to each season. Just by way of contrast, in in New Zealand, for example, we we had unexpected snow two weeks after all the snow melted in the South Island, and in the very late summer we had uh, a frost that um, affected a number of producers in central Otago was unheard of, unexpected, and a dramatic event that people got caught out on. So volumes are a little bit lower in 2019 from central Otago, despite the quality is very high at the same time. Less, less is available just because we, you didn't see it coming. Yeah. yeah, and these are our major growing regions in Oregon. We have 19 AVAs. We spread from the north. Uh, where we border Washington and we share some uh, shared AVAs with Washington where the Columbia River is the border to our state. So Oregon and Washington, the Columbia River splits it. Um, in the east, where it's essentially high desert conditions, so um, very continental, harsh winters, often winter kill and uh, frost and freezing issues with vines um, in late October, November uh, and through the winter months. Then uh, we're very much focused on warmer climate varieties out here in Walla Walla and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah. The Rhone and Bordeaux varieties are really king in this region because of that very harsh, hot um, continental um, temperatures in the summer and then very cold uh, winters. Um, the Milton Freewater AVA is our, uh, one of our newest AVAs, which is an AVA that's centered entirely around um, a soil series, those um, Milton Free, the Freewater rock, Rocks series. Um, so that's a very unique um, series. And if you Google Kevin Pogue, um, he's a geologist who has some, you know, just amazing facts about all of the uh, Missoula floods and, and all of the soil compositions up in this area. Um, and he petitioned for that AVA um, successfully. As we move uh, to the west, we move into um, the Hood River and the Columbia Gorge AVA, which is where there's a ton of diversity and in the afternoon, um, well we are in the afternoon session, in the next flight uh, you'll see a couple of wines from there as well. This morning session we had a mixed white um, from Burgundian varieties uh, from the Columbia um, Gorge and so we'll have some interesting wines coming from there. We have Menthea, Tempranillo, Primitivo, there's everything planted up here and it's a very, very exciting area close to Portland so you get a lot of enthusiasm from the younger generation who work, you know, night in Portland, come out and farm their vineyards in the day, and there's a lot of that, you know, grower maker growth in that area. It's really exciting. As you move uh, 
further west, you get to Portland and the Willamette Valley, which is definitely our largest AVA in the state, um, where the bulk of our production of wine comes from. The bulk of that production is Pinot Noir, which was featured this morning. Um, within that Willamette Valley AVA, which you see is quite large, it's three and a half million acres. There's only 20,000 acres planted presently. And so there's a lot of room for growth there. And we're starting to see some of that growth happening and the interest from outside interests coming into our, our valley there. But you can see more clearly here that the uh, Willamette Valley River system, this is really a Willamette Valley watershed area. So that's what the AVA is based off of. And then the seven AVAs are in the North Willamette Valley. And that's the nested AVAs. So based on uh, volcanic and sedimentary soils of varying components, primarily Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, but a lot more varieties being planted as people are a trying to diversify but also looking at climate change for you know what is to come in the next generations they have young children they're young themselves what are we going to be able to ripen you know we've got Syrah planted Cab Franc Tempranillo is all appearing in the northern Willamette Valley um, so a very you know interesting area. Then as we move south, we're in the, another large AVA, which is the Southern Oregon AVA. And then within this AVA, there are nested AVAs of Elkton, Umpqua Valley, Red Hills, Douglas County, um, and then further down, Applegate, uh, Rogue River Valley. Um, really similar soils, but more granitic deposits, much more mountainous, much more uh, valleys higher elevation vineyards. The Most of the vineyards here are, are at around 1,800 feet and above elevation already. So they're planted on river bench lands, but they're also sheltered by mountains. So as in the north, we've got shelter from the Coast Range and the Cascade Range, which runs the length of the state. We've got the Klamath Mountains and the Siskiyou Mountains in southern Oregon, which really buffer us from the Pacific and from some of the hot weather that comes from California, and then we've got the Cascades that buffer us from the east. So a very um, localized climate in here, very high elevation, huge diurnal temperature shifts in this area. So really interesting grapes being planted. Everything from Italian, Vermentinos, Sangiovese, Barbera, through to Rogue, sorry, through to Rhone varieties and Bordeaux varieties and Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is still the major grape variety planted in Southern Oregon as well. And that's a view of the lovely Columbia River Gorge. So you can see it's just absolutely stunning. If you haven't been, you need to come visit. It, the picture doesn't do it justice. <clears throat> it gives you an idea of our production. So Willamette Valley really making up the bulk of it, but followed closely you know, by Southern Oregon and increasing, and the gorge is increasing as well. But really, 70% of production is from the Willamette Valley and will continue to be. It sits around Portland. It's got the major cities. It's got the uh, state capital, Salem, Eugene. Those really is where the bulk of the population lives also. 72 varieties are grown and counting. There are Petit Arvin, Fumin, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Albarino, um, yeah, it's, it's insane. Uh, it's also a lot of fun and that, um, you know, experimentation and diversity is really infectious in a small community and there's a lot of sharing of cuttings and planting vineyards next to each other and finding out what's growing and people sharing. I mean, even within the Willamette Valley, you've seen Trousseau Noir um, expand to about a dozen producers who are grafting Trousseau Noir into their vineyard for off of two producers who had it. So there's a lot of sharing, a lot of excitement around what can be done and what can be achieved with all of this new clonal material and grape varieties that we have coming to us. Very good. Okay, on to New Zealand. Um, two major islands, and we are uh, massively influenced by the Pacific Ocean and the Tasman Sea that surround us. It, it is unquestionably something that is an advantage to our country. The zone, if you like, of Auckland and north of Auckland, in fact, the Bay of Plenty, which is really sort of that scooped area on the right-hand side, north of there is unprotected territory, meaning there is no um, hills tall enough to block prevailing weather. And so we have 
um, the need for people to plant their vineyards in very, very specific places where some shelter can take place, the soils protect the aspect and so on. All of those um, Wine 101 stuff that you need to know has to be here. The soils are really quite young. It's mostly clay-based with a grey, wacky base underneath the bedrock of New Zealand. In the Northland area, it really is red wine territory before white wine. So there is Syrah, Cabernet, Merlot uh, grown there. Chardonnay, certainly, for sure. A tiny, tiny bit of Pinot Noir and then the experimental varieties, which um, don't need to be listed. Auckland, which is a major hub, it used to be our capital. The isthmus between the Pacific Ocean and the Tasman Sea is one mile. So you can see that the, the, the impact of um, prevailing weather has a dramatic effect on Auckland. Doesn't stop us planting our grapes on Waiheke Island or up in Matakana or Clevedon, and we ripen Bordeaux varieties very well there, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, and so on. The Waikato Bay of Plenty area is one of those areas, whilst there's a large volume of land there, it's more forestry than anything else these days. It is home to our um, um, a propagation station, our quarantine area for um, um, budwood that comes into New Zealand. The Gisborne area on the right hand side on the east coast gets a lot of sunshine, perhaps almost the most. Nelson gets the most, but um, Gisborne uh, is a very, very isolated area. Uh, Vionia, which you'll be trying today from um, that place there, a lot of clay soils again, a bit of sedimentary rock, a bit of sort of gravelly stuff starting to emerge. Hawke's Bay, of course, is uh, perhaps one of the better well-known wine regions of New Zealand and a GI in its own right. And there's a dramatic difference between what you might grow and expect on coastal placed vineyards versus what might be inland. This is where the rain shadow effect of New Zealand starts to take place because the Southern Alps rise in the middle of the North Island moving south. So Bordeaux varieties, all the Cabernets, the Experimental, the Tempranillos, the Tanats that we're growing down there now, the Fianos are all happening, Alberino, Grunewald Lina is all happening down in Hawke's Bay as well as Pinot Noir, as well as Cabernet, as well as Chardonnay. Down to the Wairarapa, which is that Greater Wellington province area, still benefits from a double rain shadow effect. There's enough hillsides on the coastal side to help a little bit protect and then some on the western side. But it's an isolated area, lots of silty river deposits. Uh, a little bit of limestone starts to show here. And varieties, Pinot Noir is um, really the, the queen of the grapes down there, or the king, whichever way you look at it. But Riesling does well sparkling wine. Onto the South Island, Nelson, lots of sunshine. We tasted a Pinot Noir, um, sorry, a Chardonnay from there earlier on today. And not too, dis not too dissimilar from the soils of Marlborough, there are a lot of gravelly soils, silty deposits, a little bit of limestone again, but it's a valley floor or a hill. That, those are your two choices for that area. Marlborough, the largest, Sauvignon Blanc is the driving force of Marlborough plantings. But, and it's a big but, um, Pinot Noir, growing variety there in terms of um, sparkling wine production as well as still wine. Chardonnay, of course, is huge for sparkling wine production and still table wine. A lot of experimentation going on with Gruner and Alberino again, Petit Mancine, which you're going to try today. And um, so it's very, very, very interesting and evolving area with the heartbeat really being Sauvignon Blanc. Canterbury, limestone, limestone, limestone. And I think that um, that coupled with the heavy sedimentary rock, um, some gravels again, uh, make very, very interesting <coughs> wines. And then we've got the entire Otago province. And there's central Otago, which you probably know very well for Lord of the Rings and bungee jumping and all that kind of stuff. But there's also North Otago, which is the borderline between Canterbury and Central. And that is a tiny, tiny GI of, in its own right with all of about six producers, but very worthwhile um, visiting because it's like stepping back in time 20 years in New Zealand. And you would have tried the Osler Riesling upstairs if you um, had lunch uh, with us today. And that represents that area. So in terms of varieties, I guess like Oregon, we have a lot. And um, Sauvignon Blanc, Marlborough are really collectively the two largest representations. But you'll see Pinot Noir is the strongest variety for red. Chardonnay is the strongest variety for white behind Sauvignon Blanc. 
but we are doing a lot of nice things with Riesling. We're experimenting <coughs> with skin contact. We are pushing the boundaries with oak. Organic viticulture is strong. I would say more than 20% of New Zealand producers really are practicing with about 12% of them cert certified overall. Biodynamics is an underlying factor of a lot of um, vineyard practices as well. Oak, all French. We import a little bit of German and a little bit of uh, American. We have fooders we import. We have eggs we're making uh, locally. We have um, cigar barrels. We have um, puncheons, the whole lot. So we are well equipped to make good wine. There are only two drugs of choice in this world, right? Alcohol and caffeine. Those are my two. But hey. We have, we have legalized other stuff here. <laughs> and Oregon, yeah. That's a discussion for a bottle of wine later on. <laughs> um, so we like this statement. We definitely agree with it in, in Oregon. And uh, I think the statistics about sustainability uh, for both our countries or regions um, is definitely firmly cemented in, in environmental and social sustainability. 47% uh, of Oregon vineyards are certified sustainable. So that's live certification sustainable. Um, in addition to that, we have a number of producers that are organic certified and also um, Demeter biodynamic. And as Cameron mentioned, a number who are practicing but don't get certification. So there's, with how many small producers we have, there are a huge number that don't get certified. 35% um, of US biodynamic growing is in Oregon. So that's a fairly large number considering we're such a you know, 1% of production, um, but we're very committed to biodynamic certifications and believe in the importance of, um, you know, putting your money where your mouth is in terms of sustainability and cert certification efforts. Um, Oregon also has uh, five, I want to say seven now, of the B Corp, um, 14 uh, B Corps uh, wineries. So that's a... Um, more of a social business sustainability certification where you have to ha uh, have certain equitable um, you know, practices in place as well as um, social stewardship and uh, as well as environmental. So very complete, very comprehensive and I think that comes back to our culture in Oregon of being small grower makers and working alongside you know, the person who's farming your grapes or having your kids run through the vineyard um, very much in touch with our commitment to um, certification, sustainable certifications. One of the questions um, that you may have asked yourself before coming today is what, what is the relationship between Oregon and New Zealand overall? And I think Brie alluded to part of that um, just a minute ago with small producers. Um, that's very much part of our story as well. Sustainability is a very clear message for New Zealand as well. And since 2000, that project uh, across the growers and the winemakers of New Zealand to become certified sustainable is at that 90, 98% mark. That is a significant percentage of the entire country that's dedicated to sustainability. But I think that uh, in part to answer that relationship between Oregon and New Zealand is the sharing of information as well as the commonalities. And it, it's easily 20 if not 25 or 30 years ago that the, um, the winemaking philosophies and sharing between New Zealand and Oregon started and it started because of Pinot Noir and it was based in Oregon so that's one of the strong connections today. Um, you'll see you know the figure of 35,000 uh, and a half um, hectares which is nearly all of New Zealand's plantings overall uh, is dedicated to sustainability so the message is, is strong and it's something for the future. And, and it, 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 there's a great saying, I'm doing this for my grandchildren. We're doing this for two generations from now. That's, that's the whole point of it. Okay. Okay, let's get into tasting some wine finally. We can ask questions, please you know, talk, ask questions. Um, you know, this isn't just a lecture. <laughs> we want it to be engaging. So um, we're going to start running through the wine. So the flight, first flight is whites. Uh, we have, uh, it, we jump around a little bit, um, and then it's 
tech, well, it's not really a white grape variety, so we'll get to that anyway. So let's start with um, the wine one, which is from Oregon. It's from uh, the nested AVA of Ribbon Ridge in the Willamette Valley. It is from, uh, so Willikenzie uh, sedimentary soils um, located within a single AVA um, that's just isolated for that Willikenzie soil type. Um, this is actually Shannon Blanc. It's from the Omero Vineyard, uh, which was um, grafted across to Shannon Blanc and about 15 other grape varieties. Um, and Chad Stock of Minimus Wines planted that grape variety in that vineyard. And now uh, Brienne Day at Day Wines purchases a lot of the fruit from that vineyard, which is where some of the Trousseau and Shannon Blanc and Petit Arvine and other interesting varieties came in as well. So this Chenin Blanc is um, organically certified and farmed with some biodynamic practices employed. Uh, 2017 as a vintage in Oregon was again one of the driest and hottest on record. We had a number of extreme heat spikes during that growing season um, and we saw that in California coming through as well. Um, thankfully, you know, we did have um, a mild entry into the spring and so um, we did have some, you know, nice rainfall to, to rely on to get us through that growing season. But it was a challenging season in that a lot of the vines that um, were younger vines did shut down for extended periods of time during those long heat spells. You know, we all know that when a vine gets above, um, you know, 33 degrees, it's shutting down, 30 degrees, it's shutting down. Um, when that fruit zone is, it can be a lot hotter within there. So it's dehydrating the fruit and the vine shuts down. It doesn't photosynthesize, it doesn't do anything, it just stalls out. And in that crucial veraison growing phase, it's a very dangerous phase when that long lag time Time is impeding when you don't know when your next you know storm is going to come in so you're relying on that flavor development to try to kick back in there um, so this Shannon Blanc is uh, off of older vines but it's been grafted over for three years um, and this is Brienne Day's first um, attempt with the grape variety there's a lot of excitement around Shannon Blanc in uh, Oregon in the Columbia Gorge and the Willamette Valley, and also up in uh, the you know border areas of the Columbia Gorge as well, where you get slightly riper styles from like Memelus um, and and those producers up there. So this is a definitely a cool climate rendition of the grape variety. Um, it's she does ferment it um, partially on skin, so she um, whole cluster um, so de stems puts it into a bin, foot presses it, leaves it for overnight, and then presses it the next day, and then allows indigenous fermentation to happen. It then goes into, um, well, goes into old French barrels, so neutral French oak. You don't see a lot of oak impact on this wine. Um, and so she's very much just trying to explore what the variety can do in the Willamette Valley on this site. There's a number of other producers that are planting this variety now as well. Any comments on the wine? I've got a comment. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I notice when I smell a wine like this, I, I, you know, from a Somme's perspective, it's like, I better be damn sure I know my customer before I show them a wine like this because it, for me, it reminds me, it, it's that wild ferment, kombucha, apple cider combination flower smell. Yeah. And it, 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 it's dramatic. It's a dramatic wine to lead the flight. And, um, but it tastes delicious at the same time. So it's about getting people through that journey. Is that a challenge for Oregon wines, really? Uh, for producers there, do you know, maybe to get their message out there? I mean, I think from this producer, it's not such a challenge. I think this is, you know, a lot of her styles of wines. Um, she's part of that newer guard that comes out that does natural ferments. Mm. So, I mean, there's not a lot of this grown. So it's a very niche market that she's selling to. I think the people that she knows who she's selling to appreciate these styles of wine and are actually looking for a little bit of that yeah, acetic, acetic funk on there mm. and, you know, it really tightens up the palate and gives you, you know, that salivation, you know, it's a, it's, it's a possibly a good food wine. <laughs> okay, very interesting. 
challenges to actually bounce those particularly in far west. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. so that really kind of rounded out. Yeah, which is how that funk got there in the first place. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, not being able to ferment to dryness. So yeah, that that interplay between the sugar and the sourness, that kombucha character, and I think that really appeals. I hate I hate saying millennials, but to a younger generation who are used to I drinking fermented food, yeah. you know, fermented drinks and fermented I'm a foods. <laughs> so. Yeah, okay. And that's uh, probably, yeah, a little bit of that skin contact and that natural oxidation that's happening in there. Who likes yeah. this wine? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're all millennials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all millennials. Yay. Okay. Very good. Uh, all righty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We need more of you. <laughs> um, the next wine, we move uh, way south down into the Applegate Valley um, within the Rogue Valley. So the Applegate Valley is a nested AVA within the Rogue Valley. <laughs> Troon Vineyard is a biodynamic estate that is uh, really focused on starting to reimagine their place in the Applegate Valley. They have a numerous amount of varieties planted. They have Primitivo, Tanat, Vermentino, Merlot, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. It, I, I don't know what the person was thinking when they planted that vineyard, but it's certainly interesting, and it's a bit of a scattergun approach. Um, but what they have found is that by planting all of those varieties is that actually the sort of Mediterranean or Iberian varieties actually perform really well on that site. And the site is a mixture, it's bench land, so it sits up above the Applegate River. It used to be a wide concourse um, river, and so it's now, you know, the Applegate is drizzled down into a very small stream. It's not really a stream, but it's a you know, reasonably sized river. Nothing dramatic anymore, but all of those sediment, granitic, alluvial, granitic sediment deposits are sitting up on the benchlands now. So this vineyard is at around 1,900 feet elevation um, on very free-draining granitic and alluvial soils. And what they found um, with that combination of nice free-drained soils, um, a sort of rocky minerality that comes into the wines here um, and sitting in the shadows of you know the Klamath mountain range um, the diurnal shift here at that that elevation combined with some of the shadowing that happens from the very close mountains results in wines that retain their acidity very naturally the area is very dry and very warm you're hitting above a hundred degrees regularly in this area, often up to 108, 110. It is, you know, like cowboy country. You feel like there's rattlesnakes everywhere when you're down in there in the summer. It is beautiful. It is raw and wild and stunning. Um, it's completely different to the Willamette Valley, but this diurnal shift that happens at night and the shadowing just really helps protect that acidity and crunchiness in the wines and the long, have, you know, long growing season here of dry weather and sunshine is really what allows these Iberian varieties to really shine. So what Troon Vineyard is now doing is going through and regrafting or replanting to a lot of Italian varieties, so Sangiovese, Vermentino, um, Barbera, Dolcetto, um, they're really, Fiano is down there as well. Tanat does so well in this area. Um, so they're, re they're planting more Tanat, they're planting more Malbec, um, and they're really, really, you know, starting to make some striking, varietally distinctive wines from this site in the Applegate. Um, also, Grenache. There, even within the Applegate Valley itself, there are different little pockets that are more heavily. Grenache dominant and where the acidities hold in Grenache and Syrah are a little better um, in certain pockets. So um, it's really a matter of knowing your site and you don't get to do that until you spend some time on the site and make wine for a few years from it and then you can make some decisions about what really grows well there. 
So this Vermentino um, actually sees some time on Lees. They're making a couple of different Vermentinos now, um, but this Vermentino is um, whole cluster pressed. It goes into um, an amphora for part of its fermentation, into a concrete egg for part of its fermentation, and then just in a uh, regular stainless steel ferment fermenter for, for the rest of it. It gets blended together and is put in neutral oak uh, for eight months before it's released. I really like there's a certain herbal element to it, but on the palate, what I love about it is, for me, Vermentino needs to be salty. You know, it needs to have some saline notes. And so I really love that delicious, you know, saltiness that comes on the palate of this and makes it you know, distinctively Vermentino for me. Yes. Uh, I'm Yeah, you know, I think that also comes down to their philosophy now is that they're growing biodynamically and they're trying to make more naturally driven wines. And from a um, stability standpoint, you can't have residual sugar in your wine um, above, you know, sort of a gram ma you know, maximum mm. if you want to um, distribute it nationally because it risks, if you don't cross flow it or filter it, it risks going through secondary fermentation and starting, you know, a little bit more, you know, spritz on the palate than you may intend. And it could go to dryness anyway in the bottle. And so from a cultural philosophy standpoint, um, they're trying to move away from um, grape varieties that they need to do anything manipulative to. So cross flow filtration and other filtration, they feel, um, is not what they want to move towards. So they're really starting to push towards a natural element there. But I, yeah, I definitely see your comment and agree, yeah. Okay, wine number three, Elephant Hill. This, is, this Again, this is a very different expression um, of wine for you on the back of two very um, distinctive wines. First and foremost, this is a blend of Pinot Gris, uh, Viognier, and Gewurztraminer. The smallest amount is the Gewurztraminer. It's all in, all in that order. There's a little bit of barrel ferment with some of the juice and most of it's stainless steel. And it is um, uh, essentially a co-fermentation as opposed to a blend. What we're dealing with here uh, is winemaking that is not on the edge, per se, compared to wines one and two. This is a much more um, clean, modern approach to viticulture from the very southern tip uh, of the Hawke's Bay Oceanside. And the vineyard itself is all of 150 feet from the edge of the uh, Pacific Ocean and no sand, these are rocks. And so you can imagine that the soil just off the, the beach there is rocks, um, hard soil, and is a hard environment. It's a very tough environment when it comes to offshore winds. But I think what they've achieved here is something that, um, ha something I alluded to this morning was that pure expression of fruit. And you can identify the Pinot Gris, you can identify the Gewurz, you can identify the, uh, the Viognier that is in here. And taste-wise, I mean, it, it took me a couple of minutes to get over wines one and two to be able to actually get the nose and the palate of wine number three. You really have to um, uh, consider that wine separate and individual. There are very few producers in New Zealand who do uh, co-ferment co white wines in this way. There might be the Sauvignon Blanc semi on set, but they tend to be blended wines. Um, there's a program in New Zealand that you might see when you fly Air New Zealand down called the Fine Wines of New Zealand program. There's only one wine in that lineup that is uh, a blended white wine. Everything else is single variety. So it's not like it's new territory for us, but it's something that requires uh, a slightly different philosophy. And this is very modern farming. This is not, minim uh, there, there is minimal intervention, but it's still modern 
um, grape growing for you? I really like, um, you know, so often with co-fermented wines, whether it's co-fermented reds together or co-fermented whites, you lose completely the, the presence of any individual grape variety in that co-fermentation. But I feel like there's a really lovely commingling here of Gewurztraminer and Pinot Gris that seem to sit so nicely together and almost bring out a, a muskiness. Mm. And, and it, for me, it's a really compelling wine yeah. and, and quite a you know, pretty wine. Yeah. yeah. Um, the bad news is this is the last vintage that they made of this because essentially what they've discovered is they can do single vineyard expressions of these uh, quite successfully. And so the uh, Ali Lefont of Ali Font, if you, that didn't jump out at you before, uh, n no longer exists, but you will be able to find individual expressions of this moving forward um, in, in the US market in a year or two. When they can release they sell Gewurztraminer? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. They can sell Gewurztraminer. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next wine. Yeah. Y yes, sir. A gentleman called Steve Skinner. Steve Skinner is his name. He's been there from the beginning. And he's the one that introduced Elephant Hill to cigar barrels that they've got there. And not interested in the eggs at this point, but they certainly do that. And they're a medium-sized winery, I have to say. They're not, they're, they're not in that 5,000 case set. They're in that sort of 20,000 case bracket. It's a barrel that is more, um, it's flatter and it looks like a giant cigar. It's longer like a yeah. cigar. Yeah, and the staves are a minimum of 50 mil. They have very, very thick staves in there. Yeah. It's slower ingress of oxygen, but you also get more lees contact with the wine instead of quite so much. Are they generally green wine or it's like hard to cover? Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's for fermenting a portion of a blend of something. It's not like you would buy 100 cigar barrels and then this is the cigar wine. Although that might have a nice, <laughs> you know, steak restaurant feel yeah, about exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. But I would say, well, certainly in New Zealand, I think Elephant Hill are the only importers of cigar barrels because they're just, they're not, they're not popular. Eggs are popular. They're, they're yeah. from Bordeaux. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tradition in Bordeaux. In the very southern part of Hawke's Bay, before you move across into the White Arapa in the Martinborough Territory, is where this next wine comes from. And uh, it's called Lime Rock for a very good reason, because on one side of the hill you've got a lime quarry, and on the other side of the hill you've got a vineyard. And so this vineyard is planted 100% limestone based. And Grunewald Liner is a variety that is I would say in a fairly new variety for New Zealand. We're still f finding our way with that. And when we had um, Austrian winemakers visit New Zealand, they said, it smells and tastes too much like Sauvignon Blanc. You're doing something wrong. And what we figured out was that our ferments were too cool and that we had to increase the temperature of our ferments to blow off all of that pyrazine character but retain enough that made it smell and taste like Grunewald Lina. And I really, you know, 2018 vintage for Hawke's Bay, pretty, pretty actually special, pretty good. And um, I'm curious about Grunewald, Lena, from your, your thoughts. Question. In, in the, in the, when, when you cross over into the new zone of the wider app of the Greater Wellington area, limestone is... Um, becomes f more fractured in the soil, okay. all right? So in that southern Hawke's Bay, there's obviously a giant seam there, and then it becomes more fractured in the wider Arapa, and it doesn't really pop up again until really parts of um, Marlborough, and then it's very strong in Canterbury and North Canterbury, yeah, sort of the Pyramid Valley parts of the world and so on. And then you'll get pockets of it in, uh, a lot of it, sorry, in the Waitaki Valley, so that Osla wine upstairs that you may have tried, that's entirely on uh, uh, riverbed and limestone. Yeah. And then pockets of it in central Otago. Yeah. Um, Grunewald Lena is, yep, another question. Austrian 
Yeah, I think that that is. I mean, it's a really good question, but I, I would, I would argue that it's not ozone. Res the, the pyrazines are not uh, uh, an ozone-related condition at, at all. I think that the the the, 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 the whole the ozone hole. Yes, it's shrinking, but it's still massive, <laughs> right? And it still covers the whole country in the in, in the ripening period, and we and, and we get sunburn. If you get thicker skins, then then you will get more. You may get more pyrazine characters, but it's about harvest and when you harvest. And you can a lot of Sauvignon Blancs are blended juice from um, several tries through the vineyard to to create that those aromatics. And so if you ripen a little bit longer, you're you're reducing that herbaceous, that grassiness in favour of more elegance in the wine. Also, um, I, I mentioned earlier on today, I think it's called selenium. We don't mm, have any selenium. in our soil. And because of that, um, New Zealanders have to have it in their diet, but it actually um, promotes pyrazines in wine as well. The fact that we're cool climate promotes pyrazines and the free draining um, riverbed soils promotes it as well. So Pyra pyrazines are, are photodegradable as well, and so there's a, you know, there's a viticultural balance here between not wanting to burn the grapes, between mm. all of that sunshine and UV that's coming into the vineyard there. So you have to have dap, you know, canopy management that has those, you know, the leaves really protecting the bunches of grapes like this, and you can go through and leaf pull but you're never going to get direct sunlight on those bunches because they're go at that extremes where New Zealand sits, they're going to sunburn the grapes before they ripen the fruit and photodegrade the pyrazines. So there's that, you know, there's that balancing act that, that we up here can actually do with some of our Savion Blanc. <clears throat> I have Savion Blanc from the Applegate Valley that the vineyard is so poor um, in nutrients that it actually doesn't put out any, you know, very few leaves. And so the fruit is golden and it has not a lick of pyrazine character. Um, and so you can play around with that a little bit to create a style, but when you're in a climate where you've got so much UV and sunlight and sunshine and you're going to burn the fruit, you just can't risk letting that fruit you know, get too much sunlight, so you've got that dappled light effect, mm. which doesn't degrade as much. Over the last seven or eight years, I'm curious about the Sauvignon Blanc production in New Zealand and those flavors. Uh, just go to Jansen's Robinson website and just type in New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, which has published probably five or six articles since 2012, and describe the farming technique to get there, and it's sort of like it's a finer point on what you guys have talked yeah. about. So, yeah. 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 And I think a you know a buzzword from a winemaker's point of view is thiols. Yes. Mm. And if you understand thiols, then Sauvignon Blanc begin to make a little bit more sense. Right, we're moving to Gisborne, um, or Gisborne as the locals say, for this next wine, which is from a pioneering couple of biodynamics in New Zealand, James and Annie Milton, and they are. Uh, leaders in New Zealand in terms of the biodynamic movement. They're not the only people who um, practice that, um, but they're certainly early on in that story. And this wine is barrel fermented, but very old 600 litre um, barrels. And so there are, it's, it's more about structure. The aromatics are very specific and it, and it smells biodynamic. It's 100% Viognier. It's some of the oldest Viognier vines in um, the Gisborne area, and it's a fragile variety, I have to say. It's something that um, will either move you or not, and you know, I'm forever doing this with my glasses because I want to get those aromatics on the back of every other wine, but it is pretty. It is organic in its smell. It is clay-like, and I think that represents those soils, and this isn't flatland territory, although the, the, the vineyard that this sits on has got a very, very deep humus layer to it that they tend with all of these, you know, these seaweed potions and all that kind of stuff that biodynamics are all about. And it's, again, it's about the best expression they can make with a variety that they're in love with. And I know that Viognia is not for everybody, but I think this represents um, what they do particularly well. 
and funnily enough, you mentioned Jancis Robinson, um, um, is very enamored of Gisman Pinot Noir that Milton um, grow and make, but you wouldn't think of Pinot Noir from Gisman in, a, in the first sentence when you're speaking. It's actually more of uh, a white wine territory. But that's this wine. Okay. And in complete contrast is the Viognier right next to it from the Rogue Valley in Southern Oregon. And this is from a valley that's a lateral valley over the next mountain range from the Applegate Valley, both within the Southern Oregon AVA, but the Applegate Valley sits nested within the Rogue Valley AVA. So this is from the easterly side of the valley. Bordeaux varieties are really what reign in this area, and Cresselle cellars uh, produce only Bordeaux varieties. So Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. So this wine is uh, fermented in older French oak barrels. Um, is definitely not natural in its in its bent. It's fairly correct winemaking, um, and uh, you know inoculated with a neutral yeast, essentially. Um, cool climate fermented in stainless steel and then moved to um, old, well, one, one new French oak barrel. Um, but very cool climate in its Viognier expression, more of that sort of passion fruit curd and blossom mm -hmm. and, um, you know, apricot, but very, you know, floral in its, uh, in its style. Um, so even though the days are quite hot here, again, those the shadowing of the mountain ranges of the Klamath and uh, Siskiyou Mountains that really capture this region, you know, create quite a cooling influence. And so you don't get big, fat, opulent Viognier um, in this area. I think Vion Viognier as a, as a variety is not something that can be, that can be treated like Sauvignon Blanc will say, where you can just like leave it be. It'll grow on its own. You actually have to look after these vines, um, particularly, and I think in you know the Loire Valley would be a good example of where that's well practiced. And so, in order to get those delicate aromatics, you have to look after um, these vines, particularly. And whilst the, the, you know there are similarities between that and the Milton, Milton's dry farmed. Was is this a dry farmed vineyard? Uh, no. So Southern Oregon, you cannot really dry farm very well, okay. so especially right. in that area. So, so this is not a dry yeah. farmed vineyard. Yeah. Uh, and then the final wine is from the Willamette Valley, and this is from Kelly Fox. Uh, so this is a, a natural wine. <clears throat> Kelly Fox uh, interned with David Lett in the Willamette Valley uh, when David Lett was still um, in charge of, of Irie. And uh, this is from one of the older vineyards in the Dundee Hills called the Marsh Vineyard. It was planted in the uh, early 70s. And this uh, is a skin contacted Pinot Gris, which is uh, fully skin contact um, made to dry fermentation um, in basically a, a fruit bin um, and then also in a egg. So it goes into an egg. Um, wow. The majority of it is in an egg, um, so it gets pressed once it's getting close to dryness, and then it goes back into the egg for its entire for its lifespan. Once once the fruit bin is pressed and the egg is pressed, there's enough juice for it to spend the rest of its life in the egg. So this um, Kelly Fox farms all of her own vineyards. She works with uh, roughly three parcels. Um, throughout uh, Dundee Hills and McMinnville AVAs primarily and she biodynamically farms the entire vineyard herself and makes the wines um, essentially biodynamically herself as well. Uh, she's almost a one-woman show um, and this wine is I think her third vintage of foraying into um, skin contacted Pinot Gris Prior to that, she's been fa fairly consistent as a Pinot Noir producer um, and really only working with, with the fruit from those, from those vines um, from Pinot Noir vineyards. Uh, but she does now make a, a Pinot Gris and also a Pinot Blanc as well um, and is really starting to expand. What do we think of Pinot Gris in this style? 
Yeah, little smoky. Yeah, that's the reductive nature of that bean and that um, egg. Yeah, constant lees movement, but always a lot of lees in the in the egg. Mm. Again, it's a very specific wine, and um, I don't recall what the 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 TA pH kind of numbers were on a wine like this, but they seem very particular. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ramato. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, this is really where the next generation of Pinot Gris is going in in the Willamette Valley. There's a number of producers who make a Ramato style um, or a skin cap, skin contacted style of Pinot Gris. There's sort of been a reimagining of Pinot Gris of late in the Willamette Valley. It's not particularly economical to make, um, you know. A, a Riesling-esque style white wine from Pinot Gris, you're never going to compete with Alsace or Italy in terms of production and style. Um, and it doesn't crop very heavy. It actually behaves a lot like a red grape variety in the Willamette Valley. And if you look at the color of it, it really does range from you know dark, you know, cranberry pink to gray to you know bordering on just tinted. So it's a highly mutable, um, very you know, interesting grape variety. And there's been conversations around the concept that we've been handling Pinot Gris incorrectly in the new world um, you know, for some time. And I think that this is just a conversation for diversity in that there's, if you walk through a Pinot Gris vineyard and you're tasting the grapes as they're ripening, all of the flavor for Pinot Gris is in its skin. It's quite tannic, and all, there's a lot of spice and flavor in the skins of Pinot Gris. And so producers and the younger producers who are familiar with you know, these skin contact wines from Friuli and Georgia and, and elsewhere are really actually quite comfortable with thinking of these grape varieties as being quite fluid um, in terms of how you make them. There's no, there's no right or wrong anymore. And so I'm actually finding that the most successful Pinot Gris these days are ones that have some portion of skin contact to give the wine some tension on the palate because otherwise the wine can just be, let's face it, fairly boring and flabby. You know, it's kind of broad, slightly sweet. Um, you know, you never know what you're getting. But when you've got a skin contact style, you've got some tension and structure and interest and spice going on on the palate. And so this is where I think a lot of exciting Pinot Gris is being made. Yes. I mean, it just seems like Pinot Gris in just like quick chat Yeah, exactly. You know, there. I think there was definitely a camp for that um, style of production. But you know, realistically, when you're looking at the economics of making Pinot Gris in Oregon, it's it's not economical. So these these producers, you know, are you know having to blend it with Riesling or other varieties just to actually make it interesting or economically viable. So unless you're making really purposeful Pinot Gris, um, I think that's where you can actually you know, be economically viable is when you're building something really yeah. detailed and beautiful. But you can't you can't make a cash cow of Pinot Gris in the in the Willamette Valley. So I agree with your statement. Yeah. I, I agree with your statement too and I think it's it's Pinot Gris is a lesson for wine producers um, that must be taken. It's like you've got to do your homework and learn from Pinot Gris to understand that it can be made into a plethora of different styles and expressions from zero to some oak, um, to, from wild ferment uh, to um, blending. And uh, I'm not sure if you were upstairs, there were um, a couple of Pinot Gris upstairs that were more quote unquote traditional but done very, very well. And I think Pinot Gris done well is actually a very difficult wine to make and then when you move into uh, a skin contact example then then you you're, you're moving into a new galaxy a different territory yeah, i just think that this as a, as a summary this kind of wine is maybe one of the most food friendly of the price that i think you can like go with any like, i mean mm. it'll work with like 
steak tartare or smoked salmon or it's like short ribs and it's just like so versatile. Must be a song. Um, I, don't think, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I just I think that's like that's the kind of wine you really open people's eyes for. Yeah. Like, uh, really yeah. To, to try something like that, but not tell them that's with the right pairing. Yeah, I mean that's a really serviceable wine when you can you can serve that to a table who's all having something completely different, and you can please everybody with that one wine. Yeah, yeah I think I think that's exactly. It's almost a light red. Yeah. So, yeah. Good sure, point. you had a question. Mm -hmm. I think it's a vo it's a volume statement, isn't it? It's a volume only. It's yeah, qu I mean, it's a quantifiable. It's a, it's a quantifiable volume statement for less right. than one percent production of right. the so, world's production. Right, right, right. So what I'm saying is, like, you know, when you go to, when you go to a, a wine shop, you know, it's a, you know, a you're not seeing ninety-nine California wines for one Oregon wine. Like the ratio is quite closer. Oh, I see what you're saying. Where, yeah. Where does where does the zoom sit? So, in terms of, yeah. Obviously, I get, I get that the, 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 the statistics are the, the statistics yeah. are the metric. Where do they sit in terms of, like, in the fine wine market, the premium wine market? They're, they're probably closer to their, uh, their big brothers. Within the fine wine market, I would say we're still even, yeah, I mean, within the fine, mar fine wine market, because all we really make is fine wines. There's not a lot below that from either of us in terms of economic viability. So we really only play in that fine wine sector. So um, we probably, yeah, over, over you know, are over delivering in that sector as well. Um, I'm not sure what the figures would be exactly. I don't think I don't we have know. any figures uh, like that. It's tough to find figures. The point is, no matter how you slice it, certainly for Oregon, we are a region of discovery. We are here with consumers all the time. I'd buy more if I could find it. Yeah. So ex yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, ex expanding that category. There is a shortage of tier categories, at least in a market like New York, which is probably not representative of like a national market. But right, it's a very different country in that respect. Well, New York, yeah, I mean, New York's our largest market. New York is Oregon's largest market. There's over 200 producers present in New York. Kind of one of the reasons why we're here today is because we we know we know that you're all interested, but maybe we can show you something else. So you know you're in you're a highly engaged market. Um, you know so so of the fine wine sector, New York. You know we're not selling this much. You know if I go and do this you know seminar in Ohio, I still have to get out the map and say. Um, Oregon is on the west coast, we're above California and below Washington, you know, so I don't need to do that in, in New York. You guys know where we are and you're, you're used to talking about Pinot Noir, but so that's sort of why we wanted to expand that fine wine conversation into Oregon Chardonnay and then the alternative varieties, which sometimes we can make us a little more available at that entry level. So where the consumer is maybe not, you know, not so willing to spend so much money, maybe that's where some of these different styles can come into that as well. Or you've got your regular Oregon fan, but you can now sell them a Mencia from the Columbia Gorge. You know, um, you, there's a lot more, you know, adventurous consumers here and adventurous sommeliers as well who are confident with what they put on their lists that they'll be able to sell it and tell the story around it. All right. So we want to show you um, some pretty exciting red wines as well. We're going to start the story off with uh, Columbia Gorge. Yes. Oh, there we go. 
So the, the first red wine is a Menthea from Analemma in the, in the Columbia Gorge. So this is a producer that's sort of midway in the Columbia Gorge. It's getting a little warmer than, say, where Hayu was this morning, where it's primarily Burgundian varieties. Um, and Menthea, actually, when the first time I went to the Columbia Gorge and stood in a vineyard there, it was February. It was cold, it was raining, there was fog, I couldn't see the river, there was fog sitting all within the river. All I could see was Douglas firs forest and some vineyard posts poking out, but lots of fog and lots of mist. And it reminded me of being in Ribera Sacra at exactly the same time of year, a couple of years earlier. And when I commented on this to Nate Reddy, whose vineyard I was standing in at Hayu, um, he said, oh, you need to go and see Steve Thompson at Emma He's growing Menthea. And so I was like, of course he is. It looks like Ribera Sacra. So, so that is the story of this wine. And this is the fourth vintage of Menthea, so they are very young vines. Um, Steve, and, Steve and Chris Thompson, um, they're, they have an orchard. It's, it was in their family or in Steve's family for a little while, um, and they started uh, planting vari new varieties, um, Pinot Noir Chardonnay. Yes, they purchased Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from across the river in Washington as well, um, but they started planting on their own property um, Menthea and Shannon Blanc and uh, Spanish varieties. So they're really Albarino. Um, they're playing around with a lot of uh, diversity in that area as well. And so this wine is made basically like a Pinot Noir. It is, um, you know, whole cluster fermented, um, pressed and transferred to barrel. Very natural. Um, no fining, no filtration, only indigenous yeasts. Um, and every year it gets, it gets a little more refined and I'm just excited, so excited about what this grape variety can do in, in that region. Um, it's, it's actually proving to be quite a good region for Spanish, or should I say Galician varieties. Um, Nate Reddy has a, uh, has a handful of Galician varieties planted as well, and they're all really performing um, just really beautifully. Um, so this is, this is the Menthea from Analemma. The altitude. Um, it is only about 750 feet to 900 feet elevation on that slope. Um, and it is in the foothills of Mount Hood. So, you know, they are getting some, it gets very warm during the day. They grow literally across the street from him. The orchard is just cherries. And down below him, where you go into Mameluse, it's, you know, vineyard and cherries and pears. So it's still orchard country, um, but it does get really nice cooling shadows from um, the Mount Hood uh, forest area as well. Any questions about the Menthea? Any comments? What do you think of it? Yeah. It's really pretty, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, and that comes into it again, you know, when we talk about Oregon wines as well is that, you know, we talk about even Pinot Noir, we're talking about, oh, it's, you know, it smells a little earthier, it's kind of like Burgundy, but then you get it on the palate and there's more fruit than Burgundy would ever have. And so you find that across all grape varieties. And I think, again, that comes back to that slightly extended daylight hours, um, you know, more sunshine and also... Don't forget that during our growing season, we don't get any rain. We, from you know, June, July, we are dry until September. In, yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely. Come in the summer. <laughs> um, but in the, in, the winter, you know, in the winter is when we get our rainfall. In Burgundy, they get rainfall the entire growing season. We don't, we don't get that. So we have you know, more vibrant fruit components in our wines. Now for something completely different. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So Cabernet Franc, grown in New Zealand, is 
probably something that is new to probably nearly everybody in the room because it's not something that you would expect to be vinified as an individual variety on its own. And also coming from uh, a cooler climate area of the South Island of New Zealand. So you have to factor those two things in here. So this producer is called the Bone Line and they have managed to produce this wine in a very, very difficult vintage for them with a lot of rainfall and there's a lot of um, uh, material that they could not harvest and they had to do a lot of leaf plucking as well. And to get the essence of Cabernet Franc, the, the way you smell uh, and taste it today, has to be, um, you know, some would say perfect opportunity but I think what they've done or what they've achieved here by using l very, very little oak is still managed to get the essence of what Cabernet Franc should be like. And it's a, it, it's a great lesson in itself about Cabernet Franc. One of the things I make my students do, and you can be my student for a moment, um, is that in order to dissolve away the tannins from the preceding wine, you have to produce more saliva in your palate. So you have to cleanse your palate with antipodes, water first, uh, and then deliberately produce more saliva. And I know you can do that because you're human. Um, and then try the wine twice and base your assessment of this wine on the second taste, not the first. Because Cabernet Franc needs to be pretty, it needs to have violet, it needs to have a little bit of that licorice and that, that green aggression that Cabernet Franc brings to a Bordeaux blend, but this is on its own. So this is North Canterbury Wiper soils. There's some limestone here, but there's some gravelly under base. And it's a very small volume production wine because of the vintage, but it's something I wanted to show you. Can we do Cabernet Franc, A, in New Zealand, and B, from the South Island? And have we been successful in, in that regard? Heck yeah, that's delicious. Oh my goodness, yeah. So varietally correct, but I love that there's some graveliness underneath as well. It's that, mm. it's got the sweetness of fruit, but there's a really mm. lovely earth, yeah. you know, gravelly yeah. minerality, yeah. freshness underneath as yeah. well, which, you, that freshness is so important. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, for me, I there, there is a minerality there and I like the tension and the texture, the graveliness as you call it from um, f from the tannins, but not too much of anything, not too much yeah. acidity, not too much. And um, so it's a nice little pure expression. And again, the challenge for you in, in, in trying these wines today is what, what is the application in the, the programs that I have, whether it's retail or on premise? It's a drink. Mm. It's a lovely drink. It's a lovely drink. That's really pretty. Moving on to something that I think is pretty special. Pretty special. Um, I want to read you the technical data on this wine. This is called Narkitty Kitty and it's one of the new flagship wines of the Villa Maria group in New Zealand. And Narkitty Kitty means the gravels. So this is a Gimlet Gravels wine. It is new to the market for New Zealand. This wine is brand new to the USA as well. Some of you may have seen it before. Here's the technical data. This is 97% Cabernet, 3% Merlot. 100% Gimlet Gravels fruit. The average age of the vines, well, um, it's from 1992 to 95 of the planting. So we've got enough vine age to figure out that we can do Cabernet well in the Gimlet Gravels. 100% destemmed fruit, 42 days on um, skins, lots of plunging, 18 months in French oak, 50% of which is brand new. Less than a gram residual and a thousand cases, and those are six packs only. So this is where Cabernet is going mm. and where we think it should go for New Zealand uh, in Gimlet Gravels. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. 35 to 42 days, so it depends on the parcels, I guess. Um, I think it's pre, pre and post. It's got to be pre and post. Yeah, can't, it can't be that long. That yeah. 97% Cabernet, 3% Merlot. 
All right. So again, this is what what does Cabernet? What, what should Cabernet do when it's almost 100 percent in the, from the Gimlet gravels, and it should have a gravelly smell about it. This is the gravels. It can get particularly warm. The Gimlet gravels is one one inch topsoil, one inch, four inches of sand, and then it's stones for as, as deep as you want to dig. Right. So when it rains, nothing stays. 100% irrigation has to take place in the vineyard, like the, in, the, in the area like the Gimlet gravels. Powerful. Powerful, lovely structure, but elegant as well. You know, there's there's a finesse there on that palette as well with the power. <laughs> Took your teeth hostage. <laughs> yeah, this is chewy. This, this is a chewy number, it's focused, it's concentrated, um, it's powerful, but it's young as well. So the question re really for you is, will, will a wine like this age? I think the answer is obvious, and from a vintage like 2013, and we're only just into 2019, we've, we've, you know, we've got 20 plus years left in a wine like this. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to show it to you because, it, because there's so little of it around that it's about making you think about the potential and making decisions about Cabernet in the new world um, from New Zealand. Uh, it's quite a bit, 13.8. That's not, that's, yeah. oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Wearing my Californian hat, that's low, yeah. Even in terms, that's not Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Thirteen eight. So, that's exciting. All right. Yeah. Now that's a very good question. If I uh, the wholesale price of this wine in New Zealand is something around eighty dollars before tax. Eighty New Zealand dollars. So it's under a hundred. But I would say uh, in a retail store, I, you'd be looking one hundred and fifty, hundred and eighty dollars. Yeah. I hope, I hope, and hopefully higher, because I don't want. It's the kind of wine you don't want to sell until much later on. And the next wine is from the Rogue Valley, um, from Vulcan Salas, which is a new producer, um, but not necessarily a new winemaker to the region. Um, JP Villet, uh, Juan Pablo, is from um, Mendoza originally and Argentina and moved to uh, Oregon in the early 2000s, I think it was 2001, and began making um, Pinot Noir primarily and then moving south into southern Oregon um, where he found some Melbeck and, and other Mendoza varieties. Uh, but he has a very lovely hand with Pinot Noir, which I think also comes down to his Bordeaux varieties as well. Um, and what JP says he loves about making Cabernet and Malbec in the Rogue Valley is that he doesn't have to acidify it like he does in Mendoza. <laughs> so <laughs> he says it's very easy for him. Um, the fruit ripens very naturally, and the diurnal temperature really helps to retain that freshness and purity of the fruit. There's very low disease pressure. Um, the fruit just ripens very naturally. Um, and so he's really excited about the wines that he's making from Malbec and Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, this is a single uh, clonal variety, Clone 6, which came up from California. Um, the vines here are about 14 years old, uh, and he's just, this is his second release of, of Cabernet Sauvignon. So definitely not as densely structured as the Villa Maria, um, but I think you see that, again, that cool climate influence um, and delicate hand, you can't really, you know, over extract the wines um, in in these areas because they just become beasts. So it's more about knowing where to, you know, pull back and let and let the winemaking do itself. So gentle, gentle um, plunging, pump overs to begin fermentation, and then punch downs twice a day. Very much like Pinot Noir fermentation for this wine, and then it goes into old French barrels. 
but very clearly Cabernet ulcer. That's what he's saying. Uh, the acidity drops because of the pH shift when fermentation happens because they're picking the wine so high in alcohol um, that the, the potassium shift during fermentation that's happening is, is influencing the microbial capacity. So you either have the, oppor you know, the opportunity to add um, tartaric acid at the beginning of the fermentation so that your wine stays within a healthy range um, so you're not you know, going to get Britannomyces um, starting to happen in the ferment. Or you can add Vulcaran or something, you know, nasty like that, like they do in other areas. Um, possibly. <laughs> Depends if there's stem inclusion in there as well, right? Because if potassium content in stems will reduce acidity, therefore you have to compensate and add some back, maybe. But just... Well, it's green, so it's like pure as you know. So you can't pick it earlier because you're not getting the flavor not right now. Right, like no, it, it's during the alcoholic fermentation where it's getting into a. You've still got sugars in the wine, but you're also getting al you know the alcohols struggling and the yeast struggling as well, and that's where Britannomyces will often appear. Mm -hmm. Or when malolactic fermentation happens before alcoholic fermentation is finishing. And then you're opening yourself to microbial infection there as well. Mm. Sorry, we got a little off track. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Says the MW student. <laughs> so part of the future story of New Zealand, if um, we're at a good time to move yeah. on there, part of the future story of New Zealand is the Syrah story. And th this will be a telling group of three different wines. And of course, I'm excited about it. The first one from F Marlborough. And I talked about crunchy fruit, uh, about Marlborough as being part of the profile of those wines. I don't necessarily think that is true for Syrah from Marlborough. But just at the outset, this is 100% biodynamically grown fruit from the day the vines were put into the ground and has not been managed any other way since. They produce a Syrah every year, and this is 98% Syrah. There's a 2% little co-ferment of Viognier in here, just to maybe fix the color completely, yeah. um, add a little bit of a, a pretty tone to it. But you know, if Syrah is Pinot Noir for grown-ups, you cannot look at the color and go, this ain't Syrah. You just have to accept it, the color that it is, and it's all about what Marlborough can produce for Syrah grown by biodynamically and what, what those aromatics are, are a reflection of sight 100%. This wine is everything that I love about New Zealand Syrah. It's just quintessential, speaks yeah. of New Zealand Syrah yeah. every yeah. step of the way. Yeah. And it's just so fragrant, such a beautiful aromatic mouthful that I, can we have this bottle at dinner tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, right? It's right. just yeah. a bowl of, yeah. 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 See, <laughs> I, I don't find it particularly peppery, whereas you you do. So I, I, I'm, I find the, the fruit expression quite powerful, and I find the, the, um, the, the florality of the wine quite powerful. But um, it, it just means that everybody's palate's different, and... Is everything right with that? For me, it's like a, it's like a glass of um, you know Asian five spice in a glass. You know, it's got everything going on there: the green peppercorn, you know, all of all of those characters, but also that exotic florals and musk and violets and all. Oh, mm. my, yeah. yeah, yeah. The other thing is, this is very extremely low alcohol on an American scale, I have to say. Yeah, that. yeah. This is only 12% yeah. alcohol by volume. Yeah. Is that because of Marlboro? 
I think it's a reflection of vintage uh, and low cropping winemaking. So 12%, that really is quite, quite, quite low. And but the desire to drink the bottle in one sitting. Mm. And I think one of the signatures of Syrah from New Zealand, and in fact Syrah from around the world, but particularly so in New Zealand, is that it is, um, always has this backbone of acidity. You cannot miss it. It, it really is um, quite noticeable. But the tannin uh, management in Syrah is, is such that it has to have a finesse. It shouldn't be a monster. It's you know you've got to you've got to go and play with this wine at some point. It shouldn't shouldn't scare you, and um, this is the prettier side of Syrah, that fruit concentration. Well, this and and I mean, this yeah. Makes me want to get more, but I've never even thought of Syrah. How many plantings of Syrah in Marlborough? Ooh, uh, Te Whare Rā do it, um, From do it, um, Cloudy Bay used to do it, uh, very few, very I would few. say a handful at best, it, you know, it, it really is the, the Pinot Noir Sauvignon Blanc Chardonnay, yeah. Gruner Albarino kind of a, um, a place. Speaking of Hawke's Bay, <laughs> we have a Mills Reef, um, Elspeth, and um, so that we, we really are talking single vineyard here. Gimlet gravels, fruit. Mills Reef head office is actually in the Bay of Plenty, and they used to be kiwi fruit growers and exporters. That what, that's what their company was founded on, and they ended up moving into grape growing as a secondary income. And then they realized that they were growing very, very good fruit, and Syrah being one of them. So this is a fairly youthful vintage for Mills Reef. And again, a, a, a beautiful color. 13% alcohol this time. And a fairly moderate pH overall. This to me is, in, in, in that pepper question, is, is to me a more of a, pe a powdered peppery kind of a wine. as it's opposed like a white to, pepper, yeah. this wine. Mm. Whereas the one before is more like whole peppercorns for me, yeah. This is definitely more that white pepper, dusty. And I think the taste profile is quite different. Well, that, you know, not, not black currant like the from, but more raspberry. Um, I think that's more that riper, not jammy, but riper fruit characteristic of Hawke's Bay, which is really very, very bone dry in the gravels. And again, they have to irrigate. Yeah. Do, you like, do you like this kind of style of Syrah? Mm. Oh, very good. Um, yeah. This next wine is its debut tasting. You are the first people in the USA to ever taste the Landing Syrah from Northland. The company is, this is a very, very small vineyard. They really do Syrah and Chardonnay only. And I argued with myself over to whether it should be Chardonnay or Syrah. Goes and I thought, no, let's do Syrah. So this is warm climate. This is uh, a fairly steep site that f looks to the Bay of Islands in Northland, New Zealand. And so it has a lot of coastal influence, but the soils in Northland, New Zealand uh, have a volcanic subsoil for sure. But this is clay. This is red clay, brown clay, yellow clay, a tiny bit of sand. And so it is uh, an environment in which Syrah doesn't necessarily like, but color and clay go together quite well. Sorry, Northland, New Zealand, the very, you know, ve very north of the North Island. Yeah, yeah, past Auckland, you're about two and a half hours drive north from there. So you're hitting the very top of the North Island on the eastern side. Okay, moving into the Oregon. Oh, oh we're missing, is it a quaddy? 15. Oh, missing golden cluster. 
Thank you. Mm. Just while we're pouring this. Uh, uh, this front row, I think. Yeah. Just while we're pouring this, I'm, 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 I would like a little bit of feedback from you on the landing Syrah, just in terms of texture, flavour, likability, application, anything. Viola, anybody, anything. <laughs> right. This would land in the USA. This would wholesale at probably twenty-four dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's what it would wholesale at probably. Yeah, so in the right direction. My gosh, that's a very good question, and w one that I probably cannot answer. And that it's uh, I everything, uh, the economies of scale and the, um, what do you call it, the, um, the rate of exchange will, al will always work in favor of the greenback. It will always, you will always have greater buying power with a US dollar than a selling power from New Zealand. So we, you, you will always benefit from that. Yeah, this wine retails in New Zealand for about $35 a bottle, New Zealand. Retail. Retail. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, is that value for money or are we, or is it not? Understood. Moving on. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so number eight. So number eight uh, is returning to the Willamette Valley. Um, and this is uh, from Golden Cluster, who is, um, it's a Somme made wine, essentially. Uh, Jeff Veer owns a wine bar in Portland called La Cave and uh, has been working with fruit in the Willamette Valley for a number of years and is a little obsessive about finding um, the hidden varieties that appear in um, the original Koori plantings um, at, at the David Hill Vineyards and beyond. Um, and this wine is actually uh, from one of his vineyards that he uh, was one of his first vineyard jobs, which as a teenager, when he was picking fruit um, from for an old Italian, um, who's now the namesake of this wine called Alberto. And so this is sort of a, I, you wouldn't call it a mixed blacks vineyard like you have in you know Napa or Sonoma, um, which are definitely Italian varieties, but this is, um, predominantly Syrah with a little bit of Merlot and Cabernet Franc in there. I mentioned earlier that, you know, the story that, that comes out from the Willamette Valley is that David Lett purposefully came to the Willamette Valley to plant Pinot Noir. Well, he may have been the only one with only Pinot Noir vines because Dickie Rath, who followed closely behind him, and Charles Curry, who arrived at the same time as David Lett, brought with them a suitcase full of variety to see what would actually work and so there are a number of old vine vineyards or own rooted vineyards in the northern Willamette Valley that are still planted to these varieties and it's just a matter of rediscovering them um, and so Syrah is um, reasonably exciting in the North Willamette. There's very little of it planted. There's a little bit at Christum um, and in a few other pockets, but um, it, is, it is definitely a variety to watch. And if you um, 
if you look at some of Greg Jones, um, the, our very famous climatologist, um, his, his reports uh, scare the crap out of a lot of <laughs> producers in the Willamette Valley, frankly, because his, his climatology reports show that in about 15 to 20 years, the Willamette Valley is going to be better suited to, <laughs> to Syrah than, than Pinot Noir at the moment. So, so these, these are certainly hedging bets wines um, for now, but it's food for thought. And this Syrah um, I just find to be really charming. And Jeff makes it actually in a large um, amphora that don't give off any flavor, but it's 100% clay fermented and um, very naturally made, only um, indigenous yeasts, and then no fining or filtration. Um, so fermented in clay, a portion goes back to clay, um, and then a portion goes into barrel, neutral barrel. Uh, so that's Willamette Valley Syrah from the north, from Old Vines. The next wine is from Southern Oregon again, from the Applegate Valley, from Quaddy North, from Herb Quaddy, who has planted maize vineyard. Um, Herb Quaddy is a uh, very well known and well regarded uh, viticulturist, primarily winemaker, but runs a viticultural company as well and manages a number of vineyard sites in the southern, um, in the Rogue Valley and Applegate Valley. Uh, he originally came from California, and Syrah is one of the varieties that I think he makes seven different types of Syrah. Um, so he grows Cabernet Franc and Syrah are his two main, and then other Rhone varieties around, um, around the valley as well. So definitely more of a warm climate style. The Mays Vineyard is alluvial with some granitic outcrops in it. Um, it's a mixed clone planting, uh, and he makes it fairly traditionally. There's a little bit of American oak in this aging process as well. Um, no whole cluster, fully destemmed. Um, fairly traditional, um, you know, conventional winemaking, um, but very small production from individual vineyard sites. So this wine um, has really got some nice vine age on it, but is really quite representative of um, Applegate Valley from a west-facing slope vineyard. So you get that sort of robust, warm, purple fruit um, characters coming through there. I like that nice dusting of pepper that is sort of left in the middle of mm. your palate beside all of this ripe dark fruit, the sort of brambly blueberry fruit that sits there and the dusting of, of pepper that comes behind it, I find you know really compelling on that wine. Yeah, the dark chocolate espresso, yeah, and that nice little oak influence, yeah. Um, the Golden Cluster Alberto was $25 retail. <clears throat> And then the final wine is uh, from uh, the Rocks District of Milton Freewater. It's the Veritas Sequitur. It's 2014, so it's got some age on it. Uh, and it's 100% Syrah from this tiny AVA, which is all of about 12 acres, um, currently planted. And um, this is from a very small uh, two and a half acre vineyard. And uh, this is uh, Billow um, and Pinto Nar Navarain. Uh, Billow is a recent master of wine, um, and he's been making wine up in the Walla Walla area for a number of years now under the Rasa label. And so this is his first wine from the Rocks District of Milton Free Water. Um, and we're expecting to see more wines coming from this ABA. It's just that people have to make the wine in Walla Walla on the Washington side, so they can only label it as either Walla Walla or, or Oregon. Walla Walla, Washington. Um, so 2014 has some nice you know, age appearing on it, a little bit of maturity. Um, the, the, this wine is $95. It's 13.7% alcohol. It's a very short growing season. These guys are really like chasing the weather right down to the end. Um, in late September before the leaves fall off the vine. So they're, they're really watching these wines until that potassium shift happens. Um, in, and you know you don't want potassium dumping into the vine at the end of the season. So they're trying to get ripeness um, before, that, before that occurs. Um, but really interesting wines. I'm quite, um, 
I'm quite captivated by them in the sense that they're completely different to me for Syrah on the palate, and I just haven't experienced anything quite like these these wines from the uh, Milton Freewater area, which makes them really compelling and charming to me. Um, so I'm still in a definite land of discovery because these wines have only been made for a couple of years. So as I said, this is the 2014 vintage, and I think I had the 2012 recently. So very new AVA, lots of exploration to be done. Um, and SJR Vineyard is another um, vineyard that's right beside this one um, that this that mm. is going to make some great wine soon as well. Yes, so this is in the Walla Walla AVA. So it sits, um, shares, it's a shared AVA with Washington. So this is high desert country grape growing. And it is bitterly cold out there in the winter. And it is bakingly hot in the summer. Incredibly dry and arid. Um, you need irrigation out here. Um, and the growing season is incredibly short. You know, it is literally bud, bud break in April and and you're not, you know, you're lucky if you're picking fruit at the end of September, if you're lucky. Uh, it is 14, no, 13, seven. <laughs> All right, the final wine for the day, and we're racing to the top of the hour is Petit Man Singh from 19-year-old vines biodynamically grown in Marlborough. These grapes are harvested in small baskets, very, very traditionally so, and fermented in 300 to 500 litre puncheons for about 11 months um, aging time. And the RS on this wine is 197 grams per litre. <laughs> but the acidity of this wine is rather high. And this comes into the USA. This is available uh, as a wine. I couldn't tell you the wholesale price off the top of my head. But we wanted to finish with something that uh, hopefully inspires you in terms of sweet wine. Uh, sweet wine from New Zealand and a flagship variety of the future. Petit Man Singh. 40 Wow. That's good. This wine tastes like all your favorite desserts rolled into one. It's that custard and creme brulee combination with a squeeze of lime juice on top. It's, it's, it's powerful, intense, raw. Acid. This is high density planting as well. This is um, a lot of vines in a very, very small space um, at elevation. It's really one of the only wines that I can speak of in the Marlborough area that's planted um, significantly enough above sea level to get exposure to sunlight and disease free conditions mm. under biodynamic philosophy. Uh, to also be successful at the same time. That was going to be my next question. Being close planted, how much botrytis do they get? Because um, there's I, a definite, you know, sort of pineapple-y... There's that twang, the pineapple yeah. twang. Yeah, that steely yeah. tinned component to it. But I think that's part of the character of Petit Man Singh as oh, well. Oh, yeah, no, I yeah. love it. I mean, I, I like burgundy with yeah. a little bit of botrytis yeah. as well. Yeah. Thoughts, comments, Petit Man Singh at the end? Yeah. That means you've got to buy some now. The D word means I have to buy. <laughs> okay, very good. I, I, yeah. We do more Riesling um, sweet wines than we would Semillon. Semillon tends to be um, a, a blending component uh, rather than a wine on its own, although that's not impossible. And what else is there? We can do dessert Merlot. We've done dessert Cabernet. I don't, I've never seen a dessert Syrah. We do a lot of dessert style Sauvignon Blanc now. Always decant, when in doubt, decant. And number two, there, I think, th th this is a personal view, I think that there is a very fine line between reduction and um, um, 
minerality, uh, winemaking, and the effect of environment on wine. Uh, I think there's a very fine line between those two. It's a ra it's a razor edge, and and I'm I'm standing on the side of no yes, there might be a little bit of reduction there, but I think that that wine has changed in the you know the 30 minutes it's been in um, in that glass for this time. I I'm on the environment winemaking soil side, which is part of the message of. You know, the Oregon and the New Zealand message really today is about what, what are we producing, what do we have in common, where, where does soil and environment um, in, interact in wines like this. And that there's not too much winemaking involved here. There's, you know, there's the chaperoning of the winemaking. There's yeah. the, what's coming from the vineyard is really... So I think we're seeing something that is more environmentally driven as opposed to reduction. Sorry, that's just a personal view. Yeah, yeah I, I think I think what it comes with in the in the cooler climate is that um, lesser breakdown of amino acids um, in the, in the grapes, and so you're getting some people would call it noble reduction. And <laughs> you know, where did where does it come from? Does it come from you know fault or earth or you know climate and um, and I tend to be on that same interest level yeah. about about reduction. If it's not Mercaptan, you know, there's for me I, I find a bit of reduction in wine charming. I find it yeah, mineral mineral driven, umami driven, savoriness that I tend to prefer yeah. in wines as a as opposed to just being obvious fruit bombs. Yeah. Um, I guess also my final comment, apart from saying thank you, is that we haven't really talked about sulfur programs and sulfur regimes because it didn't seem to fit. And I th and, and I think with a wine like um, the From, which is incredibly low sulfur um, driven wine, that the reduction is isn't does that doesn't marry up to me. I actually, well. I actually also think that because Syrah by nature is a very reductive variety, you don't need to sulfur it very much because it's got it, it's got its own protection system. And if you add sulfur to it, you're just going to compound that reduction. So adding sulfur at bottling um, is really going to compound that further reduction that the grape is naturally already prone to do. Um, so I think you need to be very careful with sulfur levels in Syrah, um, and I know that actually the majority of the wines that I served today, apart from a couple of the Chardonnays, um, were all under um, 45 for sulfur, um, and yeah. some of them much lower. It's a really good question, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's down a deep rabbit hole, yeah. but we're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> So that's it for the day. Really um, appreciate your your time and attention. I know it's very very precious. And you, I wanted to yeah. ask one question. Yep. Do you, after today's seminars, do you see room for expansion of the Oregon and New Zealand categories in your programs? Is there a desire there, a willingness for consumers? I know you're already on board. <laughs> Is there, you know, a, a, an adventurousness um, or a relationship already with these regions where consumers would would feel comfortable expanding their outlook? We hope so. Yeah. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.